All right, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to our regular public health officials update uh, for COVID-19 in the Northwest Territories. Um, first off, I'd like to say a good happy holidays to everybody. Uh, I know, I hope everybody's had some, had to, had some time to take a little bit of time off. Um, of course, COVID-19 doesn't take a break, so neither have we, uh, which is why we're here today. Um, today, we're joined by Dr. Cami Candola, our Chief Public Health Officer, as well as Dr. Anne-Marie Pegg, our Territorial Medical Director. Um, both, uh, both will have short opening statements, and from there, we'll go to the question and answer section, and it'll be one question and one follow-up. And without any further ado, we'll lead off with uh, Dr. Candola with her opening remarks. Go ahead, doctor. Dr. Candola, you might be on mute there. Hi, Mike, I can't hear you. Dr. Candola, go ahead with your opening remarks. Okay. Can you hear me clearly? Because I can't hear you very well. I hear you clearly, Cami. Okay. Good afternoon. As we prepare to turn the page on 2020 and look forward to a better 2021, it is a good time to look back at the year that was. When we were faced with the largest health crisis in decades, Northerners showed they cared. They stayed home. They self-isolated when they came back from outside the territory. and they supported each other as thousands faced adversity no one expected. Because we moved early, fast and strong, we kept the virus at bay. We understood the importance of keeping up with precautions that may have seemed a bit tough at times. We stuck to the measures we knew worked to keep the virus at bay. And that meant we were ready when COVID-19 returned. Northerners saw a risk go growing across Canada this winter. As cases surged and outbreaks hit our cousins in Nunavut, we took even stronger action. Municipalities and businesses took leadership to implement protections in their facilities. And in part due to their leadership, masks are now common across our communities. It's good timing as the risk of COVID-19 grows and we escape the cold indoors, viruses can spread more easily. Everyone in that territory should be proud of what we accomplished this year. Because of your efforts, we were able to introduce, introduce a lot more normalcy to our lives than in many other jurisdictions. But we also need to look forward to 2021 because we still have a lot of work to do in the coming months. As you've seen, vaccines have arrived in the territory. The vaccine was approved by Health Canada on December 23rd and arrived in very short time into the Northwest Territories on Monday, December 28th. We will now be embarking on the most complex vaccine rollout in our history but our teams are ready. 7,200 doses are now at Stanton Territorial Hospital. Right now, our vaccine teams are working on quality assurance, training and logistics, necessary preparations to ensure safe, effective vaccines get to the highest priority Northerners first. The doses of vaccine we have now will allow us to start vaccinating our vulnerable Northerners first with the anticipated receipt of additional vaccine over the next three months. This should allow us to vaccinate 75% of the eligible population 18 years of, old, of age and older by spring 2021. Now that we have vaccine in hand, we will be working to adjust our plan to be able to start vaccinating those in long-term care facilities over the next two weeks. And then we will roll out to more priority groups 
starting the week of January 11. Dr. Emery Pegg will go into some more detail on the operational rollout of vaccine in her remarks. We will continue to evaluate this vaccine plan. And as more populations are approved to receive the vaccine, such as teens and children, we will, will provide them the vaccine as well. In the meantime, we need to keep our eyes on the road and stay vigilant as we speed towards the light at the end of this tunnel. We know that we are not yet out of the woods in terms of bending the second wave. And with the detection of the more infectious UK variant strain in three provinces in Canada, we need to be even more vigilant. This means doing our part to stick to healthy habits, the ones that we know work to stop COVID-19 in its tracks. It means doing your part to self-isolate if you're returning from travel outside the Northwest Territories. It means not booking that vacation trip quite just yet. It means staying home and away from others if you're sick, even if it's just a sniffle. It means calling your local health center or public health unit to arrange for COVID-19 testing at the first sign of illness. It also means keeping at least six feet of distance between yourself and others, wherever you are. It means masking up when you're in public and encouraging your friends to do the same. It means keeping crowds small and spaces large. It means washing your hands frequently and keeping our coughs and sneezes to ourselves. It is especially important we follow these measures as we approach New Year's Eve tomorrow. This is when people traditionally get together to party and celebrate another year. Here's a reminder, COVID-19 does not take holidays and it pays no attention to traditions. So please keep your gatherings at home to no larger than five with people you don't live with. Follow all the rules at any bars or restaurants you wish to celebrate at. And consider connecting digitally with those you can't accommodate. And if you are sick, don't go to any events and don't host them. And please stick to your self-isolation plan if you're under one right now and set the expectation that your party is a no self-isolator zone. If we do, we can kick off 2021 on the right foot and ensure we remember New Year's Eve for celebrating and not for outbreaks that started in our own homes. Again, I want to echo my confidence in the safety and effectiveness the efficacy of the vaccines we are receiving. Vaccines make your immune system stronger and help build antibodies to prevent infectious diseases like COVID-19. It is much safer to get the vaccine than the disease. Before they were approved for using Canadians, vaccines for COVID-19 were evaluated by the best scientific minds and independent experts in Canada. And our process has extremely good track record of getting Canadian safe, effective vaccines that have historically reduced the rates of many diseases, diseases that once threatened safety in our communities on a regular basis. While you may have seen reporting on serious adverse reactions to COVID-19 vaccines in the news, I want to assure you that serious adverse reactions are very, very rare. Almost all vaccines have some kind of side effects. These side effects, such as redness and a sore arm where the vaccine was given or mild fever are usually mild to moderate and they disappear within few days. While these side effects are common, it does not mean the vaccine is making you sick. In some cases, it can even mean the vaccine is doing its job. The vaccine does not contain any virus and like other vaccines, you can't get COVID-19 from the vaccine itself. The Moderna COVID-19 vaccine is a messenger RNA or mRNA, mRNA vaccine. This new type of vaccine teaches your body to protect itself against COVID-19 without having to get sick from the virus. 
mRNA vaccines are different from other vaccines because they don't contain any weakened or dead virus. mRNA vaccines send messengers send messages to your cell to teach them how to make a harmless protein like the one that is part of the virus. Once this protein is made, it tells your immune system to make antibodies against COVID-19 as if you had the virus. These antibodies give your body a head start in fighting the infection if COVID-19 ever tries to enter your body. It's like your antibodies are able to write and pass a test because they get all the an answers ahead of time. After the antibodies are made, your body gets rid of the mRNA and protein naturally. Just like a snapshot photo, it disappears and your body takes over to fight the infection on its own. Even though mRNA goes into your cells, it never comes in contact with the part of the cell that holds your DNA. mRNA will not affect or change your genetic material in any way. It is remarkable technology that has been in the works for decades and is now being put to use in a life-saving vaccine. We all make decisions about health every day. Decisions like getting our kids treated for sickness, like wearing a seatbelt when we drive or eating healthy foods. We make these decisions because we know the facts and we know these actions work to help keep us safe and healthy. Vaccines are no different. Vaccines are a safe and effective way to prevent or reduce the severity of the disease caused by COVID-19, and it will bring this pandemic under control. Vaccines are most effective when we all do our part. Immunity takes time to build, and not everyone will be able to get vaccinated right away. Even if you're not at high risk of severe disease from COVID-19, Getting vaccinated will help protect those around you who might be. Think of your friends, family, or coworkers, elders, and other community members. So get the facts. Seek information from a reliable source. Our government, the federal government, and health authorities will have the most up-to-date and accurate information. And if you haven't already, please start having conversations with those you trust about vaccination. Your healthcare provider, and loved ones are a good place to start. We are at a turning point in this pandemic. Let's work together to build the confidence in our population we need to round the corner. Thank you. And thank you, Dr. Candola. And um, we're gonna welcome Dr. Anne-Marie Pegg, our Territorial Medical Director, to give some remarks up. Uh, now as well, and I'll just remind you to turn on your camera, Dr. Pegg. Yes, hi there, good morning. Everyone can hear me? Loud and clear. Loud okay. so I'm here to give a few um, more details on the vaccine rollout. We know that people are eager to see this vaccine roll out, and we're working very hard to make this happen. Before we get to any questions, I do first want to explain the process that the NTHSSA and our partners are undertaking to ensure that we have a vaccine rollout that works for the NWT. Specifically, the things that we are working on right now include communicating to ensure a successful campaign. We need to ensure that communities and individuals have the information that they need to make an informed decision about vaccination. And we need to be sure that people can trust not only the vaccine, but the process by which it will be administered. People need to feel safe having outside providers come to their communities, and it takes time to have these conversations. We know some of the most important target priority populations, our elders, are also the most likely to be unilingual or more comfortable communicating in their traditional language. And we need to have the resources ready to explain the process and the vaccine in a way that makes sense to our elders in their language. And we also want to coordinate whenever possible for interpretation services to be available to answer these questions as they arise. Working directly with community and Indigenous governments is the path to success for communication, and this takes a bit of time to do properly. We're planning for vaccine administration, and this can be split into two main areas. 
logistics, and training. We need logistics that are built for the North. Yes, we've known about the vaccine arrival for months. And while some aspects of planning can be done well in advance, others required us to know exactly which vaccine we were receiving and to have a clearer idea of quantities. We didn't know the exact arrival date or the quantities of the vaccine until approximately a week ago. Four weeks ago, the only information we were given was a window of quarter one and an indication of late quarter one. We now have a much clearer idea of when that vaccine will arrive as it has arrived in the territory just this week. There are a variety of COVID vaccines in various stages of development and two have now been approved. While we had pushed for the Moderna vaccine, given its transport qualities that may get better adapted to our geographical environment, as I mentioned, we only received this confirmation very recently. And while we knew some of the details about the vaccine, specific ones, such as how long it can be kept in normal refrigeration and the specific details about dose preparation were only learned with the release of the product monograph, which is the guide to the vaccine product itself. So while some planning was indeed able to be organized in advance, many other aspects have only been able to be finalized in the past days. We now have a confirmed vaccine and a confirmed supply. We've seen comments on social media from people asking why we didn't have a firm plan ready to roll. We do have a plan, but adding details specific to our vaccine supply was the next step. Vaccination teams and staff have been working nonstop over the break to ensure that this plan works having tested it over tabletop exercises and making sure that our assumptions have been validated. This is not a regular vaccine rollout. The logistics are more complex. They require more planning and thought, and we've been working on the logistics for months and are close to providing the plan to the general public. Some of the factors that need to be considered are first and foremost transport and cold chain. The Moderna vaccine needs to be stored between minus 15 and minus 25 Celsius throughout its entire journey until it's defrosted. Once it's defrosted, the vaccine can be stored in the narrow range of two to eight degrees Celsius for up to 30 days, but it cannot be refrozen once defrosted. A room temperature vaccine in a vial is good for 12 hours, but once a vial is opened, it must be used within six hours. If the cold chain is broken at any time, the entire vial of vaccine or the entire carton in such a case becomes waste. There is a limited supply of this vaccine and we need to ensure that we send the right amount of vaccine into each community, not too much, not too little, and that we have a plan to use it all to avoid waste. This may be the biggest challenge currently. In a normal vaccine campaign, we have enough vaccine to give it to anyone who wants it and qualifies for a shot. This vaccine is different. We will receive our Moderna allotments piece by piece. We will not have enough vaccine for all eligible persons to be vaccinated at the same time. Some people living in the North are at higher risk because of their age and other health conditions. These make them more likely to become severely ill, such as elders or others with certain medical conditions if they contract a disease. Other people are less likely to become severely ill, but more likely to be exposed like healthcare workers or other public facing staff, and therefore they could pass the virus on to others. It's a balance to ensure that we are using the vaccine to protect the most vulnerable while also targeting those who are most likely to, exposed, to be exposed. And we're pleased to announce that in order to move towards protecting our most vulnerable residents, that the vaccine administration for elders in long-term care facilities is likely to be pushed ahead of the general vaccine rollout in order for us to move quickly in protecting this most vulnerable population. To ensure that we have enough people who are ready and willing to be vaccinated, we need to be successful in our communications and we need to have these communications come from people who understand vaccine safety and to ensure public know when and where and who a vaccine clinic availability. And finally, we need to do all of this logistics work in a way that works in the North, which is different from other locations in Canada. Flights, accommodations, staff schedules, vaccine locations, and knowing exactly how many people qualify are, and are willing 
to get their vaccination in each community is required to ensure that we send the right amount of vaccine. We will need to repeat this process multiple times in each community. Communities may require three or four or even more visits to roll out the vaccine for everyone. A typical schedule for a single community may include a first visit or local health staff who are already in the community working to meet community members who have questions, to plan logistics, and to ensure that we know how many people are being vaccinated. A second visit to administer the first doses to the highest priority individuals. A third visit to provide the second dose to individuals vaccinated previously and to administer first doses to the next round of priority individuals and so on until we have vaccinated everyone who wants to be vaccinated. For each of these visits, we need to send the right amount of vaccine and clearly communicate who, where and when people will be vaccinated. This needs to be done for remote communities that sometimes don't have accommodation available and must factor in the logistics of Northern travel. This is a big challenge. Our logistics team is working very hard and we will be successful. We need to scale up cohesive and well-trained staffing as well. It's easy to think that any healthcare provider who knows how to use a needle can administer a vaccine, but it's much more complicated than that. Each provider in the Northwest Territories who provides vaccination requires a certification through the Education Program for Immunization Competencies, or EPIC. Many staff already have this, and anyone who is hired on may need to get it or make sure that theirs is up to date. In addition to this, there's additional training specific to this type of vaccine. For Moderna, this training includes ensuring the cold chain has been maintained, appropriate documentation when delivering the vaccine, and educating patients. Again, we only received this information specific to the vaccine several days ago. And so training has now begun to ensure that vaccination staff are able not only to safely administer the vaccine, but to answer questions from Northerners about it. Finally, we need to do this on top of the regular care services we deliver. It's critical that our basic services continue alongside this major undertaking. We are diverting some resources from within our system to do this, but we also need to hire or redeploy and train additional staff to do the work, including logisticians, nurses, and coordinators. Some of these staff will need to isolate in hub communities before they can travel to deliver these clinics. The NTHSSA has hired or redeployed 18 logistics staff and 43 nurses already to administer vaccines and ensure the cold chain is maintained. This is complex work and it needs to be done right, and we are working very hard to get it done as quickly as possible while doing it right. Our staff, including those responsible for planning this vaccine rollout, have been working tirelessly, including through the holiday, where they have sacrificed their time to ensure that this happens as quickly as possible. We have all made a lot of sacrifices over the last year. Dealing with COVID-19 has been a challenge for everyone, and we have done very well. Let's keep up our efforts in following our public health orders while we roll out the vaccine. Stepping up and getting your vaccine is an important part of our collective efforts to beat COVID-19. And so we encourage everyone who is eligible to get their shot when their opportunity comes. And thank you, Dr. Pegg. Um, we're gonna move, now move to the question and answer portion of the, of the presser today. Um, I'll just note first that I did end up muting some uh, phone lines uh, because there was a fair bit of echo going on during Dr. Kendall's opening remarks. So just keep that in mind uh, for when I call on you. Uh, again, just one question, one follow up, and we're going to go through the list as many times as we can. Uh, and I'd like to start with uh, Bailey Morton at uh, uh, True North FM. Yeah, thanks, Mike. Um, I was wondering. Uh, if you had more specific dates about when vaccinations are actually going to be starting being administered. Doc, Dr. Pegg, did you want uh, an opportunity to answer that one? Yeah, sure, I can go ahead. So we don't have specific dates yet. Uh, I have come out of a meeting just before this press con conference where that very question uh, has come up. And we are working really closely with communities right as we speak 
uh, in order to look at what will work for them uh, and how we can best get the, the get the vaccine out, um, particularly for priority populations, um, but also how we can make sure um, that that's delivered in a timely manner. Thanks, and one follow-up for you, Bowley. And uh, just a reminder to our principals that we are streaming, uh, so just to turn on cameras when answering questions, if possible. Yeah, thank you. Um, I was wondering if, again, this is another details question. I was wondering if you had outlined which communities are set to get vaccines first, and are those more rural communities, so vaccines uh, won't be being administered in uh, like bigger communities like Yellowknife and Hay River? So I can speak to this briefly and then probably Dr. Kendola can add in. The, the prioritization is based on uh, likelihood of severe outcomes uh, and also geographic risk factors. So right now we're looking uh, at a at a moved ahead rollout for some of our most vulnerable populations, uh, which would be long-term care residents and staff. And following that, there'll be a rollout according to various other priorities that uh, Dr. Candola has spoken to um, in, in other conferences, but uh, perhaps maybe wants to give a refresher now. Um, thank you, Anne-Marie Pegg. So just to uh, reiterate that four priority groups are First category would be elders. Second would be those at risk of severity if they develop the disease because of um, chronic disease risk conditions. And the next group would be frontline workers. And the final group are remote indigenous populations. What we are planning to do, um, and we're in the process as, is to first prioritize the highest risk about all these priority groups are our elders, especially those in long-term care facilities and the staff that support them. We know that we have um, long-term care facilities in the seven main regional centers. That's a priority is to get the long-term care facilities vaccinated as soon as possible. Indigenous and remote communities are a high priority as well and we'll be targeting them in the initial rollout through mobile teams. So we are aiming to try to reach all the priorities groups as quickly as possible. The first priority group that we are working on as soon as possible are the long-term care residents and the staff that support them. Perfect, and thank you for your questions, Bailey. Uh, I'd like to move to Ollie Williams at uh, Cabin Radio next. Yeah. Thank you very much, Mike. A question for Dr. Candola. You've outlined the scientific evidence that supports use of the vaccine. Clearly, you were trying just then to reassure people that this vaccine is safe to receive, which all the evidence states is the case. But we're seeing a lot of vaccine hesitancy, to put it mildly, in the way some people are responding. And of course, you need a certain proportion of the population to get the vaccine for herd immunity to work. How frustrating for you is the current level of hesitancy and what what else can you do to convince people to get the vaccine? So we are ramping up our communication. We are providing uh, vaccine FAQs. Um, we'll also be doing a vaccine rollout plan. And so we'll have the science, the facts that we do know uh, rollout plan available in um, shortly next week in a rollout plan. And we know that with this Moderna vaccine, the mRNA vaccine, it is a new platform, but the Health Canada and the National Advisory Committee of Immunization has independently reviewed the evidence and they have felt the vaccine is safe and efficacious. What we, we need is um, for people to be able to communicate their concerns, provide them the information we have and have an ongoing dialogue. This vaccine will be rolled out first to the priority populations and we have January through to March and early April to continue that conversation. The general population won't be receiving the vaccine until later on, but we do know that the vaccine will save lives, especially in the priority populations. And we will provide those with communication materials. And if people have additional questions, they can always send that their concerns through the generic CPHO at gov.nt.ca email. 
I prefer that they contact us and express their concerns through an email and we can respond to them than um, not having the information and expressing the concerns through social media because that just heightens anxiety. And a follow up on the topic there, Ollie? Yeah, thank you, Mike. Uh, Dr. Candola, what's your minimum target for the number of NWT residents you need to see vaccinated ultimately at the end of all of this for this to be effective? And how big a problem will it be for the NWT if that target is missed? So the most important uh, target group are our priority populations. We would want to ensure that anyone who is at increased risk for severity uh, from COVID-19, it's the ones that would have increased risk for hospitalization, ICU admission, and death, that we get as many of those priority populations vaccinated as possible to protect them. And then to protect NWT at large, we do want to have herd immunity ideally up to 70% of the eligible population. However, um, we will have to continue um, going. For, we won't know that goal until we reach the end of spring 2021 and look back to see how much of the eligible population we did immunize. But if we're immunizing people at high risk for severe outcomes, we would love to immunize every single one of them. And so it's, um, it's going to be that ongoing dialogue, um, communicating, um, providing people the information and responding to their questions. When more and more people get vaccinated, not just in NWT, but across Canada, across the US, where Moderna is approved, um, people will get more and more comfortable and understand the vaccine. It's just um, it's a new vaccine. It was just recently approved and I, I get where people are coming from, but it's gone through all the Clinic, the required clinical trials, and it's gone through independent review. So I'm pretty confident that this vaccine is efficacious, that it's going to work. And most of all, we want to protect people from the severe consequences of COVID-19. So it's better to get that vaccine than to end up in the hospital. Thanks for your questions, Ollie. Uh, we'll move over to CBC North. I believe we have Richard Gleason on the, on the line right now. Hi. Um, yeah, like you've mentioned a number of times that the the most the biggest priority or the most the highest priority for this vaccine is uh, elders in care and the people who are attending to them. Um, and, and you've I think you both sort of alluded to some sort of accelerated uh, plan for vaccinating that uh, group of people. Uh, I, 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 the biggest population of that vulnerable group is here in Yellowknife at Avon Manor. That's about 10 minutes from the hospital where the vaccine is being stored. From a public health perspective, focusing on that group, how do you feel about like waiting any amount of time to get the vaccine to those people? I think there's certainly room for each there and I'll start with Dr. Pegg. Sure. Um, that's an incredibly valid point. And what we're working on right now um, as part of this accelerated access program, uh, now that the vaccine has arrived in Yellowknife and is, uh, we know that it's being safely stored, we are in the process of discussing with residents and families of long-term care facilities, particularly Avens, where as you've mentioned, uh, there is a high concentration uh, of that vulnerable population. Uh, to make sure that those people also have a chance to have their questions answered, uh, that their family members have a chance to have their questions answered uh, in the case of people who are potentially not able to consent for themselves. And that uh, now that the, the vaccine is really here, um, that we're able to make sure that people are giving good, con good informed consent uh, and that we're able to do that safely. Not too complicated in Yellowknife, and as has been mentioned, the actual administration of the vaccine is probably the least complicated part, um, but the communication component is incredibly important and we want to make sure that people feel like uh, that they're getting the information before potentially consenting uh, to have one of their loved ones uh, vaccinated. And that goes just as well um, for other long-term care facilities that are relatively easy to access, including extended care within the hospital um, and also the long-term care facility in Bechico, which is also not far from here. 
So that's been our priority right now. And, and those uh, activities are ongoing, like I said, as we speak, there is a team uh, engaged in that activity uh, right at this moment. And uh, did Dr. Candola, did you want to add to that at all? Yeah, so absolutely. We need to allow people the time to understand this new vaccine, to read the information, to ask questions, and then provide that informed consent that Dr. Anne-Marie Pegg was talking about. We can't rush people and into uh, making decisions too quickly before they had time to process. NWT is in a better situation than most jurisdictions. We have no active cases in NWT of COVID-19. We have no community transmission. We've run close to 10,000 tests so of all people that can take the time and do a job well done and allow family members to read the material and understand, we're the best situated. And if something was to happen and if a family member felt um, rushed and they regret it, that would be on me um, and the system for not taking the time to address their concerns. We have the time. They will get the vaccine. They're going to be prioritized before January 11th. They'll get the vaccine. but let's please just take a day or two and talk to the family members so they know what the vaccine's about. Thank you. Um, yeah, okay, just, to, it's not really a follow-up, but it's just another question. Uh, the, um, uh, is, is anybody uh, going to be getting the vaccine out of order? And by that, I mean the government is outlining uh, priority groups, starting with seniors in care, and going to smaller communities to uh, vaccinate people there. Is anyone like, like such as politicians or um, health administrators going to be getting a vaccine before all of the priority groups are vaccinated? So I can talk for myself. I'm the, the NWT, chief, NWT chief public health officer and I've looked at those four priority groups and I don't fall in any of them. So I'll be waiting in March, just like the rest of the general population to get my vaccine and I will gladly give up my vaccine for those on the front line and those at highest risk for severity. And so if there are um, politicians who are elders and who have chronic disease risk conditions, we're not going to deny them if they fall in the category or we're not specifically targeting um, high level um, um, leaders or government people unless only would target them just like the general population if they fall in those four categories, if they live in a remote indigenous community, if they're um, high risk elders or have other high risk conditions. Thanks for your questions, Richard. Um, we'll move over to Mario Di Ciccio with Radio Canada. Hi, ah, yes. Um, I'm just, uh, I guess for my first question, it's it maybe just to better understand the, the time frame, and I'm not looking for the specific dates, but, you know, we've said multiple times that uh, we're looking to, you know, hoping to vaccinate more than, or at least 75% of the uh, adult population, uh, valid population, uh, before the end of March. Now we're talking about, you know, prioritizing uh, and all of this. So, like, when when do we get close to that 75 percent if, if everything go, goes right uh, you're mentioning uh, dr candola that you know for somebody like you would be more in march so what uh, how is that looking like so we we are grateful for the federal government to have that commitment that they would provide 75 percent of the vaccines to the eligible population in three territories which is those 18 and older and we do have priority groups, and then we have the general population. The federal government um, had um, committed to providing 7,200 doses by December 28, and that, that shipment arrived. They've also committed to send in um, multiple shipments um, on a regular interval for the next um, several months. So on a regular basis, we will be getting shipments, and so there are the main focus is to try to get the priority populations done. And for the general population, I'm looking at their first dose will probably be in March. 
this is based on the, the schedule that the federal government has provided us, but there may be good news and maybe that could change and they may be able to send um, an accelerated shipment in February. And so that schedule can change. What I do know for now is we'll have enough to vaccinate the priority populations in January, February, and, and the remainder would be in middle of March for the first dose. Second dose will likely be will be followed in 28 days later in April. After that, we would be able to know how much of the priority population we have reached, which will be, um, we'll be looking at vaccination coverage on a regular basis. Uh, perfect, just to quickly follow up, um, do, do we know when the next shipment is gonna arrive? So we, you know, we just received that 7,200 uh, doses. Uh, when, when's the next shipment, do we know that? So we do have um, commitments from the federal government to provide, um, like I said, the enough doses to vaccinate 75% of the population. So we have a, a commitment that um, at the end of January, we'll get the second shipment. And that, that would be about another 7,200 doses. This is what we know, but things could change. Um, we don't know, um, there could be ship, shipment delays or there could be an accelerated shipment. What we do know though, is that um, the next scheduled shipment will be at the end of January. Thanks for your questions, Mario. And uh, we'll move to Blair McBride at Northern News Services now. Blair, do I have you? Okay, so we'll circle back to Blair. We'll go to his colleague, Paul Bickford at the Hay River Hub. Hear Paul, me now? Yep, yeah, gotcha, Paul. Go for it. Okay, great, thanks. Uh, this is a question for Dr. Candola. Uh, Dr. Candola, I think you said earlier that you're hoping to get all these uh, uh, vaccinations, the first first vaccinations for the long-term care facilities in the next two weeks. I, I, I believe I heard you say that. And does that include uh, uh, Woodland Manor here in uh, here in Hay River? And I believe there's a there's a group home on the reserve. I'm not sure if that that would be considered a long-term care, the uh, Judith Fabian group home on the Hay River Reserve. But uh, does does the first uh, those uh, vaccinations include Hay River in the next two weeks? So when we're looking at um, the high risk um, situations, everyone agrees that our elders are at high risk for severity, especially the older they get from COVID-19. We also know that if any situation where you have elders congregating together, um, such as in a long-term care residence or assisted living, that if uh, a virus was introduced, it would spread pretty quickly. Unfortunately, that lesson was learned in the first wave um, as we watched COVID-19 spread across uh, long-term care homes across Canada. And, and we also started to see, we see it again in the second wave. So the focus of um, rolling out uh, for this high, high risk population will be the long-term care facilities and staff and support them. And then also looking at any congregate settings where you have um, elders residing together. So things like um, Mary Murphy, um, the Woodland Manor, those would be taken into consideration because it just represents such a, an increased risk if COVID-19 was ever introduced in those facilities. So the uh, vaccinations here at Woodland Manor, you, you're hoping to have done in the next two weeks. Am, am I understanding that properly? So the we're prioritizing this population first before we roll. roll um, we, we have all the priority groups and it is our um, goal to get them done in the next two weeks. Um, part of what Dr. Amory Pegg was talking about is that we can't just show up and start vaccinating people without the appropriate information and people um, 
are uh, cannot provide the informed consent because of their um, if they have um, a condition that where they can't have informed consent, such as Alzheimer's or the then it's the next of kin who have that need to be able to make that decision. All those conversations actually have to take place before we just uh, start vaccinating um, our high risk elders. So this this is occurring as we speak and the staff are working as fast as they can to start to roll that out. The specifics of um, like Hay River, Fort Smith, uh, Norman Wells, Fort Simpson, Bay Choco, uh, Yellowknife, these are the areas that have a, um, the long-term care residents. So those are the communities we would target. And the additional um, facilities that we have that also have elders, um, more of that detail will be revealed and the timing um, has the plans are made ready. I what I can say at a high level is we would target long-term care, long-term care facilities, uh, staff to support them, and any other congregate living uh, situations that put elders at increased risk. Great, thank you for your questions, Paul. Um, we're going to try and circle back to Blair McBride at NNSL now. Blair, do I have you? Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah, I hear you now. Okay, good. Yeah, the uh, the mic uh, didn't unmute earlier. Um, <clears throat> so, how exactly will it work in terms of um, like will will people in the priority groups will they have to book appointments for the vaccinations? Um, will there be like scheduled teams coming to their communities or long term care homes to do the actual vaccination? I think the most appropriate answer for this question is Dr. Pegg. So go ahead, Dr. Pegg. Yeah, uh, you've touched on actually the the main uh, logistical points and the strategy of, of how that will roll out. Um, as a priority groups are identified and as we have an idea um, of numbers in terms of those groups and in each community, uh, there will be a dedicated team uh, that arrives in that community um, for a, a period of time that uh, will be determined based on the number of people to be vaccinated uh, and those people will be notified whether they'll have a specific appointment time or whether they will be instructed to arrive uh, in a certain place as a as a, as a group um, remains to be seen that's a detail that's still being worked out certainly one of the factors to keep in mind is uh, ensuring distance and that um, people are adhering to gathering size uh, regulations and that we're not putting people at risk by uh, collecting them all in one place. But the logistics teams and the vaccination teams have worked really hard to make sure that there is a plan uh, for a flow of people to be vaccinated through each site, depending on the community um, and the number of people that are able to be vaccinated in a day. So those types of details um, are pretty much worked out. And now it's just a question of looking at uh, flight organizations and tracking and community engagement and making sure that um, we have numbers in terms of, uh, of each community and, and how to best uh, administer the vaccine. As I mentioned earlier, we need to make sure that we arrive with the right amount, not too much and not too little, uh, because once the vaccine is thawed, there's a very limited amount of uh, time in which it can be used. And there are also some constraints related to um, excess movement or agitation of the vaccine that can render it less useful. So um, it needs to be kept frozen for as long as possible and then thawed only uh, ideally in the place where it's going to be used. A follow up for you, Blair? Uh, yes. Um, <clears throat> uh, last week, Health Minister Green mentioned that um, one possibility for the vaccination program is that we'd have like uh, the flu center, flu shot centers like we had set up in the fall. Um, where people can come and get vaccinated. Uh, I assume, would, would, it, would it work like that for the priority groups or just the general public? Um, yeah, how would that work out? Uh, that's gonna depend on numbers. So obviously we're not gonna move um, people who have difficulty with mobility um, or who are already in an area such as a long-term care facility uh, or another, another area where it's difficult to move people from one area to another into a vaccination center. In those uh, situations, it's much easier for the vaccination team to go to them. But in a case where we are vaccinating a group of people, again, depending on the community context uh, in which that group lives, uh, it's likely that a site will be determined as a vaccination site, just as we did for the flu clinics. 
Um, and depending on the number of people that we anticipate vaccinating, the size of that um, may change. Uh, for example, we're looking um, at the use of school gyms um, or community centers, um, areas that are spacious uh, and able to accommodate people, making sure that there's adequate parking around uh, and lots of room for people to flow. And that's another reason why it's important uh, for the teams to get into these communities in advance. A lot of this work has been done. Communities have been working to identify the best place to set up vaccinations, um, both for space and also to make sure that regular services in the health centers aren't disrupted. And that work um, has been going on for a number of weeks and is essentially done. So now it's going to be a question of implementing that uh, plan. Thanks for your questions, Blair. Um, I want to see if there's anybody from CKLB who wound up joining us today. Luke or Francis, do I have you on the phone? Nope. Okay. Anybody from Radio Taiga? Okay, uh, so we're gonna go through as much of the list one more time as we can uh, before our principals need to wrap up. Um, so we'll start again at uh, Bailey Morton with uh, True North FM. Any any additional questions? Yeah, thanks, Mike. Um, I think it was Dr. Pegg, you mentioned the um, more infectious UK variation of COVID-19 has appeared in three provinces. I was wondering what plans, if any, um the gene you guys have been making for adapting to this strain if it makes its way into the territory uh, i think i'll uh, i think i'll probably pass that along to dr candola uh first there and perhaps if there's an operational side that dr peg wants to weigh in on but uh certainly um something that dr candola brought up so go for it doctor so the the um provinces that have reported this um, UK uh, variant are BC, Alberta, and Ontario, and they were able to connect it to UK travel. The, what, what we need to do is when we are getting the COVID-19 virus confirmation is to send the, the swabs for sequencing. So especially if we believe there could be a risk, so what we do know is uh, Canada's whole stepping up their surveillance. They're also introducing travel restrictions to UK. In the Northwest Territories, um, what we have done is where we have had um, travelers who uh, have originated from UK um, and were in isolation. We ramped up our testing. Um, we are pleased to say that we have had no COVID cases um, and from any link to UK, but it's a matter of the entire Canada stepping up their surveillance, sequencing the swabs, and seeing at what point would um, this UK variant become more of community, linked to community transmission. We don't have that yet. It's a matter of monitoring and doing the surveillance and the sequencing. Follow up there, uh, Bailey. No, I'm all good, Mike. Thanks. Thanks, Bailey. Um, we'll go to Ollie Williams one last time. Uh, nothing further from me. Thanks, Mike. Thanks, Ollie. Uh, uh, Richard Gleason at CBC North. Any further questions? Can you hear me all right? Oh, yep. Yeah, got you, Richard. Okay. Um, I just uh, wondering, uh, just as, to uh, Dr. Candola, I guess both you and the Premier have encouraged the public to refrain from traveling south over the holidays and to forego having visitors uh, come here from the south. Um, you know, we've heard of a few instances of senior officials in other parts of the country traveling south for southern vacations over the holiday despite the risk. Do politicians, in your view, have, or senior officials for that matter, have any role to play in terms of leading by example? when it comes to foregoing southern vacations, of family visits, things like that uh, over the holidays? I think we need to lead by example. Um, I can speak for myself. Um, I know the Premier has made sacrifices. Uh, we typically have um, my stepson visitors for Christmas 
and we have um, not encouraged that this year. I have um, elderly parents who are in Montreal and again I typically visit them. Um, I've forgone that. I've cancelled many trips. This is just for a short term. Um, the way I look at it, uh, the vaccine is just around the corner. Um, we just need to get for the next three months and there are sacrifices that we have to make and as the chief public health officer I need to um, be an example and um, lead the way in following that advice of non-essential travel both in and out and um, but I do want to let people know I know they're tired um, I know the winter is coming and uh, people are just wanting to just seek a sunny destination it's tough but all I'm asking is if people can just hold on for a few more months so we can get out of this together. Um, it's worth the sacrifice. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And that was good for you, Richard? Yeah, that's fine for me. Thank you very much. No problem. Uh, Paul Bickford at the Hay River Hub, any further? Uh, just one little clarification. Uh, I, I think it was Dr. Candola mentioned January 11th by the as a, the deadline of when it, it hoped that all these uh, this first uh, uh, round of uh, vaccinations would be completed is that did I hear you correctly on that Dr. Kendall January 11th so there's there's the four priority groups and um, when we're looking at mobile teams and going out because so, remote and indigenous communities are part of the one of those four priority groups is the hope is to start that on the January 11th but when it comes to the highest of the highest risk, which is our elders, especially in long-term care facilities or congregate settings, we will not wait till January 11th. We are doing everything possible to get those vaccinated ahead of time. Got it, thank you. Thanks for the questions, Paul. Mario, any further questions from Radio Canada? Uh, no, I'll be good for today, thank you. Thank you. And Blair McBride at NNSL. Uh, no, I'm good. Okay, and I just want to check one last time because I thought there might have been somebody joining. Uh, do we have anybody from CKLB on the line who hasn't had a chance to ask a question? Okay. Hearing none, and we are uh, at time here, folks. So thanks for making uh, thanks for making some time just before New Year's. Um, stay safe, gather small, and wear your mask. Have a good one, everyone. <laughs>